I wanted to begin basically with these mapping aspects, which I think it's also something which came up yesterday in several of the, of the talks. And I mean, what the question of the city and the question of the countryside have obviously in, in common is this idea that um, they're very big questions and uh, somehow it's always an almost impossibility no, to have a synthetic image of such a complex uh, phenomena. It's something Rem and I try to do when we did the London Marathon and we interviewed like 72 people in 24 hours uh, trying to kind of make a portrait you know, of, of, uh, of a city. And uh, I suppose with the countryside it's an even bigger topic in some way. Um, and to come back to Emily's notion of portraiture, I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. How can one come to a synthetic image of the countryside? Is it possible? Well, with the portraiture comparison, it has to do with whether we can basically make the countryside into one person. It also has to do with the idea of a corporate identity, right? That a corporation is a person. And cities can kind of be people. They have the personalities of people. And countries, whole nations can be people. But I don't know if something as rambling and large and uncontained as a countryside can have a personality. And if there's no human personality, then there's no portrait. And Rem, do you maybe want to talk a little bit about, because the, the research, of course, has been going on for nine years and it involves so many different chapters, yet a decision has to be made you, to narrow it down to 15, 20 yeah. chapters. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, I would like to relativize the word research, uh, because I think that is now uh, kind of really abused. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically a series of uh, observations and intuitions, uh, and not really more. And, um, and, and of course, it starts with a kind of very personal uh, combination of interest in, uh, in politics, uh, in the different political systems that are currently um, operating at the same time. <clears throat> uh, a particular obsession of mine is how little uh, the West understands of the political developments in the East. And uh, another obsession of mine is how, <clears throat> when we are talking about issues like uh, global warming, we are actually dependent on the authoritarianism of the East to save our ass here. Uh, and so basically, it's kind of really a patchwork of interest. Also, of course, an interest in uh, beauty, uh, an interest in Africa, an interest so it's a really a patchwork that then is kind of argued and kind of associated with other partners who have their own obsessions. Uh, and, and so it's, it's really not more than a collage, I would say. Huh? And I'm happy to, to, to accept that the relatively kind of reduced uh, status for, for the whole thing. It's a collage about a kind of subject. I'm also totally accepting Emily's uh, <coughs> questioning that uh, many of the things we're looking at this countryside. Uh, all of those things are true. Uh, all of those limitations are true. But nevertheless, I think there is something to be said uh, for an attempt uh, at least to uh, address many issues at the same time. And can the three of you maybe talk a little bit about this neglect of the theme? Because it was amazing to see that first image and the pile of books on the city and the kind of absence of lack of literature. And of course, this absence of focus on the countryside has had and continues to have serious political consequences also. Uh, what do you think is the reason for this, for this neglect? Because we spoke a little bit at breakfast about that, but I thought it would be interesting to, to hear more. Well, I mean, it's, it's also clear that the narrative, uh, if we take the refugee question again for a short moment, the narrative is people come from rural area, areas in Africa, uh, North Africa, East Africa, and they want to come to European cities. That's the narrative. And the fact that there's also another movement of returnees, people who leave European towns to, to settle back in the, in the African countryside, is completely neglected. So there is an almost hysterical obsession with the idea that everybody wants to come in our cities. Um, and that uh, um, in Germany, we have this discussion of mandatory residence. Should refugees be uh, concentrated in 
European towns or should they be dispersed all over the country? Uh, and so the obsession is we should avoid parallel societies in the cities. This but to me, sorry to interrupt, but to yeah. me, like, it's a bit strange to, like, call Africa the countryside. I think this may have come up in one of the one of the talks yesterday. I mean, I think what you're talking about is a, motion, a dialectic motion in and out of cities. This is the problem that we run into when we start looking at everything that is not city as the country, countryside. Because that's, to me, like, it's more someone going from a city into a, a landscape that's rural, perhaps, like, also in Europe, is more, of, to me, something that would make sense as a relationship between city and countryside. Like, a, someone moving from a European city back to Africa does not seem to have much of a relationship to the countryside. No, but it's, it, what we're talking about is basically the, the, the fact that uh, concerns are concerning the city. People, you, politicians in Europe are concerned what's happening with the city when uh, a number of ref refugees arrives in European towns. So there was... It has to do with the uh, desire for the city. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's 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 the assumption is that there is a desire for living in the city. I see. And and that concentration, that, that almost hysterical concentration uh, on uh, other people's desires to live in our cities, uh, creates a complete neglect of of possibilities and problems in the countryside. That's what, I see. what, what that was my, my my explanation for it. Yeah. Um, I have a slightly different uh, kind of perspective. I think I think it's our own kind of really limited, uh, very limited uh, attention span, and and uh, uh, kind of the limited field that we're looking at. Because since we're doing this in a kind of more or less serious way, simply reading the paper is becoming a totally different uh, experience. Uh, because rather than go to the feuilleton directly and kind of scan scan it, uh, we look at uh, kind of sports page, the e e economy page, and the kind of political pages, obviously, and, and discover that actually there's a lot of communication, a lot of information about uh, conditions that are not urban that we simply have, have ignored largely. And also, may, maybe we're just one, one last remark is that if we look into um, uh, development projects from Europe for Africa, they are all focusing on urbanization of rural areas. Whereas in Africa, in Kenya, for example, there is a uh, project by the state of Kenya for villagization, which uh, arguably is much more intelligent than to impose the concept of urbanization as a mode of success economic success to uh, other countries or even to Europe. Which is also what uh, China is doing. Yeah. And that's something actually Jane Goodall told me a lot about because we had this extraordinary encounter because a couple of years ago um, we did a show at the Serpentine with Rosemarie Tockel uh, and as always yeah, I would ask, you know, let's realize an unrealized project and Rosemarie said she really wanted to um, meet Jane Goodall and cast her hand. So Jane Goodall came to our office and, you know, spent an hour there whilst Rosemary cast her hand. So we had a lot of time to chat. And she talked there about exactly the point you made. And I think you went to see Jane Goodall also, no? Yep. Not, not me, no. I went to see Martha Robbins yeah. in, the, in the jungle. But yeah, but also, it, I, I, was, I was also intrigued by your uh, critical comment on the question, is a jungle a countryside? Of course not, because we define countryside as something shaped also by, by humans in a certain way. But then if you go to the so-called jungle, you see that it basically has been turning into a buffer zone where farmers live and gorillas live together. So I think that was an interesting thing for me to see that the, the idea of the jungle, of course, is a projection from the city. And, and so it, it looks more like countryside in that sense than what we imagined it to be uh, as a uh, untouched wilderness. I just think we have to embrace it as a quasi-malapropism. Mm -hmm. Because it is coming from... It's not going to land on a lot of these zones uh, in a directly communicative way. It's to, to frame something as countryside, whether it is a jungle or it is rolling hills in Europe or in England or in the US, which may be more traditionally what people in the English speaking world think of as countryside. There's like, no matter what, there's going to be slippage. And I think that that really needs to be embraced. Maybe what would be interesting also is that you can tell us, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the theme. I mean, Remy, you said it's a patchwork, which I think was a very nice description. So it's not kind of a master plan, but it's a patchwork of obsessions. And of course, we've been, you know, uh, yeah, testimonying this morning three wonderful different obsessions in relation to the countryside in your three great, great presentation. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about some other obsessions which are going to be part of this patchwork? And just also people you connect to, the three of you, you know, 
connect to it. Well, I, th I, th I think that the, there's kind of really underlying um, part of the kind of whole effort, uh, certainly a preoccupation with the digital, uh, a kind of a real interest in the claims that uh, Silicon Valley is making, uh, particularly the uh, constant kind of petition of we want to create a better world. Uh, and, and the kind of routine of that uh, statement, and, and uh, we definitely want to uh, explore and investigate whether there are actually any examples of making the world a better world. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, it's uh, not necessarily a discomfort with the digital, but a, a very strong discomfort with the claims of the digital. And, and I think that that is perhaps in 50% or one third of all the issues an underlying and background uh, investigation. I think what is also interesting is that, and the digital leads to that, is, is the question of, of work. No? We you know, made a, a basically um, investigation into AI with lots of artists and architects and scientists and engineers, etc., for the marathon and more and more the theme of work kind of transpired and I think yeah. it's interesting came out also in your presentations and when I came to a brainstorming in Amsterdam where you know one of these uh, days where we would spend 10 hours in a room discussing the countryside the theme of work was somehow present and maybe it would be interesting to flash that out a little bit more because when you say the countryside in terms of, of how we work is becoming very similar to the city the farmer is like us a flex worker operating on a laptop from any possible location and that also plays a big role in Nicholas's research the notion of work no? Yeah, that's something that, that really uh, struck me when I, when I went to certain countryside that, that the claim was always there is uh, a change in the way people will work, farmers will lose their jobs, people who work in Amazon fa uh, facilities will lose their jobs, but there will be new jobs created. But it might be that this is not the case. So the question is, as we frame everything through the binary opposition of work and life, and the question that everybody's concerned with is, how can we uh, bring together living and, uh, and working in the city closer? And all these concerns are focusing on the fact that everybody has to work from nine to five. But, but then there are many, many interesting researches on uh, how, work will develop in the countryside, coming to the conclusion that there will be no work anymore. And that's why the question of universal basic income is introduced into that discourse, and I think that's a very interesting topic. What happens to the countryside, not only to the countryside, but also to cities, if uh, there is a wave uh, of, uh, of uh, losses of, of jobs, and, and is it also necessarily a bad thing that we lose these forms of wage, underpaid wage labor, or is there an almost utopian chance in a moment when robotization can reach a point where um, we could finance a universal basic income? So what, what I'm doing in the, in, the, in the Harvard research next year is, is basically also research on the question of UBI and the countryside. I, I think this is one of the fascinating things uh, there is a very strong kind of undercurrent uh, of issues that were raised and uh, explored in the 60s uh, in a kind of optimistic way that in the current moment uh, almost each of them has become a kind of very pessimistic uh, and, and, and somber uh, perspective. So that is one important thing. Why were, was there a kind of real excitement in the 60s about robot? Because it uh, would and able you not to work, and why now is there a total gloom that uh, robots are putting everybody out of work? That's important. I think also the work which we're doing on OTIM and, and on its uh, Chinese equivalent is for me very important because uh, that was a period where not doing or not necessarily be involved in a single profession or not necessarily uh, being involved in a, a single uh, role, um, but being able to switch between and doing that in the countryside to either uh, temporarily go to war or to temporarily be a farmer or temporarily be whatever uh, represents a very interesting counter model in a way. A Is counter that model that might become a model again. Yeah, Niklas, you wanted to say... No, even, I mean, in the Roman language, the otium is the real state you should be in, which is relaxed and doing things you really want to do. And nec otium, which is negotiation comes from that, is something you sometimes have to do, unfortunately. But so uh, we st always stress the fact of not working, and now everybody's obsessed with the idea of work and define... Well, the issue about losing work is about losing identity. 
It's about losing your occupation and your social role is having something to do that means something to other people. There are always these fantasies of like, a, a, you know, after work is abolished, everyone will paint, but not everyone's a painter and not any, everyone gives a shit about that. They've like been farmers for years. They've had different identities. This is, you this know? is such an interesting and crucial question. Uh, uh, and this could be a new conference here in that space. Uh, do we believe that people need work to define themselves, to be, identify as humans, as social an animals, or is that already a total perversion of the way we live that we think we have to Even work Even if it's a somewhere? perversion, if it's an existing perversion, tearing it away can be an, yet another perversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's, I, I, I think... Yeah. Yeah. But you, you see that this is the countryside leads you when it comes to the question of work and the countryside. Uh, it comes a very fundamental question about what we uh, our, our assumptions of human behavior, and uh, and of course people can say it will be catastrophe if people lose their, their jobs and are left alone, and people say there might be a chance that that we can disconnect for the first time occupation from fear and, uh, and abolish not the idea of work but the idea of work and oppression of fear put together in one bowl. And I think that's a that's well. The work that will remain about. is affective labor, and I always think about the role of women in the countryside, this image that's come up very many times in this research is these three Russian women holding up bowls with the scarves tied around them. And Rabin, you're talking, you said this is like sort of an image of tradition, right? Or of the existence of... I, I said it was a picture of uh, Russia 100 years ago. Russia... 100 years 100 ago. 100 years ago, yeah. right. And so part of the, part of the romance of the countryside too is also of like the maiden in the countryside with like the rosy cheeks and the prepared food like the i mean women are put to work all over the world and not necessarily called workers um, and it's that's definitely to me uh something that's intimately related to the landscape of the countryside i also think there's something really interesting to think about if in fact there's a large-scale job loss and a large-scale uh new relationship with fear, maybe, as you were suggesting. There's a lot of affective labor to do, which is also often done by women. So maybe we'll see a whole new wave of a certain type of work happening in the countryside as women seek to ameliorate the negative feelings from lost, perverse <laughs> occupations. But, but I, yeah, but I, I, th I think you can, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's easy to, to also ridiculize it a little bit, but I, um, but I think it's happening. We have to come up with, uh, with forms of solution. What, how, can we, how can we deal with the fact that there will be massive job losses and what are our responses to it? And I'm not advocating uh, uh, a utopia of, of people painting in the countryside, but it's, I'm just raising the question, what will happen if our assumption that everybody will find new forms of work in the but countryside Bernard is not true? Bernard is actually, it's interesting, but it leads, I mean, it's in a way uh, such a huge topic, it deeply connects to the countryside, but it's a topic which is a separate topic in the way the future of work, and you know, Bernard Stiegler, the French philosopher, he says, you know, there is of course the claim for universal basic income, but he sort of adds that model, he's working with nine communes in around Saint-Denis right now and kind of produces concrete reality with these communes using the models of the intermittent work. Mm -hmm. So he uses this thing in France where the intermittent of spectacle, which is mainly cultural workers, you know, once they work, I think for 507 days for a particular institution, they then for a couple of hundred days, you know, get that universal basic income, but it's conditional, it's not unconditional. Yeah. So I think there's lots of interesting models and discussions, but I wanted to come back to infrastructure because it ties in with things which were discussed yesterday, particularly Eric, you know, told us about the, the connection between infrastructure and countryside. And that came up in, uh, in your three presentations, uh, particularly, of course, in REMS, the notion of infrastructure. And I wanted to ask a little bit more about that, because it seems that much of the architecture that makes up the countryside either verges on the vernacular or artificial recreation of vernacular architecture for tourism, but it's very often large-scale infrastructure, like server farms. So I was wondering if we, you could talk a little bit about this, and also, um, of course, there are large distances in a way that require large-scale infrastructure projects, such as roads or bridges or drones. So I was kind of wondering also what the infrastructure of the future will be in a way connecting in the countryside, you know, um, areas to one another. Because obviously that is, I think, also a key point that in a way, infrastructurally, it always still goes through cities. 
mm. there is not infrastructure mm. connections from countryside to countryside. Mm. Maybe mm. now, mm. think about Norman Foster's project with the drones, no? Could sort of change. Uh, I, I think that um, the, the Chinese are working on a kind of project which is uh, initially was called uh, the return of the Silk Road, uh, but which is now uh, becoming a kind of much more intricate uh, and aggressive uh, uh, device, where basically almost every place in Africa and Europe is connected to some other place in China. And I think that uh, that is actually uh, contrary to what you say. It's no longer a connection between city and city. It really is exactly the connection between countryside and countryside. And I think the great difference uh, in the last uh, 40 years, and maybe that is connected to the market economy, is that the infrastructure typically was something that was planned for the public good, i.e. there was a big bridge between two uh, entities and anyone would benefit from that bridge. Uh, uh, if, if, if the distance was bridged. So there was, let's say, a connection between goodness and infrastructure. I think that now that is totally gone and infrastructure has become uh, a tool of uh, sometimes very aggressive individual kind of policies or very aggressive political enterprises or very aggressive, um, let's say, corporate uh, claims and exclusions. So I think infrastructure flipped from uh, being for the public to being more for individual or ideological enterprises. Niklas, do you want to comment on this infrastructure question? Yeah, but I, I think that, that um, what is framed in Kenya, for example, as the villagization tries to bypass the inevitability of concentration in big cities and will effectively connect little sub-centers with structures that don't run like through Nairobi, for example. So I think we find in China and Africa very interesting examples of trying to organize an infrastructure which gets rid of the city as the hub, and also of the idea of mega hubs, but it's more like a network of, uh, of villages cooperating. And maybe a few last questions, two last questions actually before opening it up. I know we sort of have very little time, but I wanted to ask you, Jules Renard, and I've been reading a lot lately in the journal of Jules Renard, which has become sort of my favorite book over the last couple of months. And it's very interesting because he oscillates from the city to the countryside. And one thing he mentions, of course, is his idea at a certain moment, not only to have, you know, what he called sympathy for the context of the countryside, studying the countryside, but at a certain moment actually uh, producing reality in the countryside. So he actually, as a Parisian writer who was very involved, of course, in the you know, in, in literary world in France at his time, he became the mayor of a little village, Chitri, and you know, became... So I wanted to ask you, the three of you, if you might become mayor of a village, or what is your kind of, uh, you know, how does this project uh, feed back into reality of the countries. I mean, Rem, you're building a data center, so that's already one, one example. You're, building, you're actually building a data center. It's a question of production of reality. Well, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense that you started with a literary text, because literary texts are almost unlimited in their power and ability to produce new realities, and that extends from the city into the country. And Rem, can you tell us about I don't have uh, no. I, I don't have uh, really ambitions uh, to become mayor of a village, uh, uh, but uh, simply because I, I don't think I would be uh, kind of very good or uh, to be a good uh, use of my talents. Um, but uh, I definitely see this whole operation in a, in a kind of very political light. Uh, and um, I, I cannot focus yet. We we still have a year. To, uh, to actually define what this project uh, will be about eventually. And I hope that there will be a, a loud and clear political uh, dimension. Niklas, any concluding comment from you? No, but just on your question, what, what will change in the production of uh, knowledge about the countries? That I mean, uh, I'm working in a, a journalistic field, and, and uh, media are concentrated in big cities, and they have correspondents all over the world. but. If something happens in the countryside, someone is sent from the city into the countryside as if in like hostile territory and they come back with this anthropological view on people in the villages and I think that is extremely kind of patronizing. It should be also changed too. Wonderful. Now we can take a few questions. Uh, 
Yeah, we've got a question here. I have a question for Rem. Uh, Rem, you, you cited in the beginning of your talk to have been complicit in this kind of unequal book stack between the research on the city and on the countryside. In particular, I remember this text of yours, Whatever Happened to Urbanism, which ends with this famous phrase that uh, I loved, uh, as like many of my generation, now more than ever the city is all we have. Um, today your talk could conclude with this talk, uh, with, a, with, a, with the statement, now the countryside more than ever is all we have. And I'm interested in why you think, uh, or what has changed <coughs> since then, well, your I, perception or the world? I think it's, it's kind of really uh, totally wrong to, uh, and I'm also not implying that uh, I believed in the city and now I believe in the countryside. It's, uh, I believe in both, of course, and uh, some of the uh, kind of writing I've done is, of course, highly rhetorical, and uh, it is still true that the uh, city is all we have, and so I'm, I'm basically in a very simple and simplistic way also looking at the countryside. So it's not a big deal, it's not a conversion, uh, it's not, uh, it's simply uh, an irritation with my own uh, uh, negligence. But the, the reason I'm asking is there's a certain, there's a strange... I think it's not a big deal. That's the best. It's just not a big deal. Well, well, there's a sense of excitement in the discourse here about this rediscovery or the discovery of the countryside, which is a little bit reminiscent of the discovery of the gorillas by the German gorilla researchers, ignoring that there have been local populations being completely um, aware of these uh, creatures before. So in some way, I'm wondering why is the, has the countryside been so absent in our discourse on the city when it's clearly such a related topic? It's the other part of the dichotomy. And when also 20 years before, we could have said that For instance, in places outside of the Western world, the majority of the population lived on the countryside. St that is still the case today. When we see, look at countries like Bangladesh, where 70% of the population live in the countryside, while we at the same time can see that some of its cities, such as Dhaka, um, have a population that is twice the population of Switzerland, na namely 60 millions. So the, it's clear that the countryside and the city can only be thought in relation, in a kind of... Um, dichotomy of it and, and dialectics, but I th it seems that we only ad uh, address it as if it were kind of uh, autonomous concepts. 25 years ago it was a city, and now it's the countryside. Well, I, I, <clears throat> I definitely want to avoid that and, and kind of basically uh, I'll, I'll make sure that the, the whole thing is not uh, kind of read as a kind of anti urban um, manifestation or manifesto. And actually, um, it is perhaps the first time I was in Nigeria, I was, I think, more 18 years ago. Um, there I became deeply aware, and that was because I traveled by car from Kano to, um, uh, to Lagos, uh, kind of 3,000 kilometers, basically through countryside, uh, that this connection uh, between countryside and city is incredibly obvious, and, and actually that, that will probably be some conclusion that um, many uh, many people uh, in the world have, have connections to both. And maybe that, that is also the future that we'll have connections to both again. And, and uh, Jules Renard uh, is an example. It's, it's really strange that maybe in the last uh, 30 years the connection to the countryside has, has become broken. We've got a question here in the back. We've got actually several questions. We can take three more questions. Yeah. This one, yeah. Um, first, I want to thank you very much for, um, especially Nicholas and Emily, changing the frame a bit. And I heard a story a few months ago of a man who was um, looking for something under a street light in a park. And a police officer walked by and was like, can I help you find it? He said, yes, I've lost my keys. And so they're looking for about 20 minutes under the light of the street light. And then finally the police officer says, where are your keys? Where did you lose them exactly? And he says, oh, not here, but over there it's dark and I can't find them. <laughs> and I think there's this point that um, I'm very happy that you brought up, but I have a question, like also, Emily, where you were talking about that they're asking the wrong questions. And sometimes I'm wondering that we get very stuck in these frames and we're asking sometimes the wrong questions, which we feel are very immediate and that really respond to this reality that we've created through our literature 
history. But my question to all three of you would be, what questions should we be asking that are going to get us into the dark and start to into this kind of spreading that light out further? Because I think our focus, and especially in recent years, has been quite limited, and it's very hard to change frames. So I would ask, yeah, which questions should we be asking? Which would be the right questions? I'm always uh, very, uh, getting very nervous if uh, anyone mentions uh, uh, we, mentions we, and uh, must. Uh, 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 so um, uh, I, I think that uh, in, in this particular case, I'm not saying and I'm actually hoping that as few people as possible will kind of follow this uh, direction uh, and this uh, kind of investigation. <laughs> Uh, because it already it's becoming a, f a pretty crowded uh, field, uh, and um, uh, this uh, interest is not at all intended to make the world a better place. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I would I would also not claim for my part that I am asking the right questions. I just. Uh, experience as someone who um, spent a lot of t uh, his lifetime in the city, driving into the countryside, looking at it closely, raises a lot of questions almost automatically. Uh, and I was happy just to share with some of these questions. They're about being very defensive, but I thought that was a really nice question. And I think that one thing that I always like to look at when you're changing frames around new topics is just to get away from people. Think about how systems work, not on a human scale. Not, and I think that the countryside is actually a great place to do that because it gets us out of these sort of like prescribed personalities of like the identity of the city or of the country. That's what I would say. We had two more questions. We can take these two last questions here in the back. Thanks for, so much for this really meaty, great final panel. And this isn't addressing the three of, or the four of you so much, although I'd be happy if any of you wanted to comment on it, but it's more an observation after these two days of conversations. I think it's interesting that no one has really talked about the Swiss context in terms of this, kind of all the kind of financial support to sustain or to kind of maintain um, traditional agricultural ways of life and kind of the image of the countryside in the Swiss context. So I, again, I'm not sure if you four are the people specifically to address this or if you want to, but just to kind of put it into the room um, uh, that I think this is something that would sort of add to the conversations over the last couple of days. So do any of you want to speak maybe a bit to this subsidized countryside um, reality of Switzerland? Uh, not really, uh, because uh, uh, no, uh, no, because there's an enormous Swiss contingent uh, here uh, that, that ought to discuss this, I think, or think about it. We have a question here in the front row. Uh, my question was. Uh, um, why is, uh, for example, why is not an artist uh, also on the stage? Um, because sometimes I think that artists are um, exclu sometimes excluded of this kind of social um, and societal uh, questions, and they're seen as. Uh, Emily Siegel is an artist. Are, are you so, sorry? Keyhole is an art okay. project. Okay. Yes. Nope. And Niklas is a Niklas is a Niklas yeah, is a, a novelist I'm an and, okay. Ram and yeah. started as a filmmaker. Yeah. He's also a novelist. We've got three artists. Okay. <laughs> but I just uh, the thing, my, just my idea was is why why are not like for example uh, artistic approaches more um, taken into account in, when questions are raised like this, like um, to be more unlogical in a certain way and not too rational and try to understand and maybe not even. Um, asking questions but starting processes and seeing what what might come up don't you think that we've all been pretty irrational today i think that we were all complete and yesterday i think that we've all been completely irrational but also i'm kind of glad you bring up the question because of course it's also interesting that for the first time i mean uh, in all uh, in, in the 20 years of our infinite conversation collaborations on so many projects and you know francine felt and michelle are here from arc en rêve and we did uh, uh, this big exhibition with Rem at Arc en Rêve called Mutations about the city. Uh, and Rem, you were always very reluctant when I said we should bring in art, 
but for the first time, it's countryside. You actually started by saying R should be involved, which is interesting, no? But maybe it's too early to talk about yeah, it because yeah. it's still a year to the show. But it's definitely an interesting, yeah. it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. We can take one last question. With so many topics that sort of were scratched by your talks, individual talks, um, there was one topic that I really have to say I didn't feel I got an answer to, and that was really what is the countryside? Um, there's sort of images of the romantic countryside, and I sort of think of uh, sort of rural pastures in England with beautiful trees and cows sitting underneath and then there's the countryside that is actually our food producers and uh, the ones Rem showed of the large scale um, production areas that are actually producing our food but there's the question is, is what is countryside in the sense if it's not wilderness um, is countryside really sort of the place that we want to go spend our free time in is that the countryside that you're actually talking about or is it the countryside that's actually servicing us as um, our infrastructure for our lives in the city I'm not quite sure sort of where the definition of countryside is that um, you're all talking about I think besides the question whether it's um, uh, if we want to spend time there, it's already hard to tell whether it is countryside or wilderness or, or something intrinsically uh, interwoven with the city. So um, I, uh, I, I wanted to spend some time in the wilderness and I found myself in the buffer zone with uh, uh, farmers and gorillas in one spot. So uh, I, I came back puzzled and confused about my own idea about the wilderness and the countryside. Um, so I'm... It's very difficult to answer this question, and uh, maybe it's not even necessary. Uh, I, th I think uh, there's one word uh, which uh, explains a lot, or which is a, a very strong uh, connection between all the episodes. Uh, the digital we already mentioned. The other one is, of course, globalization. Uh, you could say that this whole exhibition is, uh, to some extent, uh, an investigation uh, into how the countryside globally changed on, under the effects of globalization. Because that is one thing that connects all these elements. And where the largest part of all the changes is also triggered, whether we want to or not, by that process. Now, Emily, you said we've all been quite uh, irrational, of course. There are lots of different departments in this project. I was actually thinking. Uh, Last night when we spoke at the dinner, I was like thinking it's almost like in Marcel Brota's, you know, the countryside project is a bit like Mar Marcel Brota's museum, you know, with all these departements. There was the Departement de l'Aigle, etc. And um, in the countryside project, there is clearly uh, a department of mysticism. <laughs> and, um, and I wanted to kind of conclude on that because Emily already in one of your K-hole reports, there was an early allusion to that new mysticism and it's now pervasive in so many you know, practices. Can you maybe tell us about, the, the three of you, about the Department of Mysticism in the... <laughs> well, the final K-Hole report centered on the idea of chaos magic, really as a way of looking at something that could also be called hyperstition, the way the fictions make themselves true. And then because we had become famous for the term normcore, everyone was trying to make it into a fashion trend. So Vogue called and said, oh, chaos magic is the new fashion trend. Everyone's going to dress like witches now. And that's not really what we had intended. It actually reared a much darker head in the election of Trump when there was all of this activity on message boards that were trying to channel the power of the Egyptian deity Keck to elect Donald Trump as a form of chaos magic. So I think that we've seen a sort of integration of these different levels of the occult, the mystical, the digital, the pop, and they're all kind of operating today alive and well. There could not be a better conclusion. I'm so grateful to, to Rem, uh, to Emily and Niklas, because it's really very, very special that we can have this conversation, which is the first really longer public conversation on this countryside project. There will be many more, and I'm sure many more departments will be added. I'd like to also thank again, uh, of course, Christina, the dream team of EAT, you know, Katarina, 
uh, uh, and also Patricia, of course. Uh, most importantly, uh, Daniel Beach and also Philip, uh, the co-curators of uh, uh, this wonderful ongoing um, adventure. Uh, and last but not least, also the sponsors. All our gratitude goes to Gubelin, to Vacheron, to Swiss Life, of course, also the city of Zuots for the, the hospitality to the mayor, also to the Ernst Goethe uh, Foundation. And of course, our formal thank to all of you for your amazing participation. Thank you very, very much.